Welcome to the latest edition of the Mind Gut Conversation, the interview series about topics related to health of the brain, the gut, and the environment. Today, I have the great pleasure to talk to Crystal Phillips, who not only has an inspiring life story, but has made impressive contributions to the field of integrative neurology. She'll tell us more about that uh, during the interview. Crystal is a former national level speed skater, multiple sclerosis patient advocate, and now public speaker and executive director of the Branchart Neurological Foundation, a charity she co-founded in 2010 to accelerate innovative technologies and non-pharmaceutical approaches for neurological disorders. Crystal's leadership, consulting, and nutrition background has given her opportunities to work with professional and amateur athletes, including NHL players and Olympic medalists, as well as world-class neuroscientists and business executives. Crystal was recently named one of 18 Canadian changemakers by CBC Canada, Top 30, Under 30 by Explore Magazine in 2012. Crystal says about herself, when not moving mountains with the Branch Out Foundation, I'm climbing them in the Canadian Rockies with my dog. Welcome to the show, Crystal. Thank you so much. Let me start with the first question. Uh, on, your, on your website, you explain what led you to create the Branch Out Foundation. And you say, my love for NeuroCam developed after being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2005. Can, can you tell me more about what happened nearly 15 years ago? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll actually, I won't take too much time, but I'm going to go back to when I was super young. I was a figure skater who was a tomboy. I saw speed skating on the Olympics, figured that was a better fit for me. I got into speed skating. I excelled really quickly in the sport. I got to travel around the world representing Canada. Um, right as soon as I graduated high school, I moved to Calgary, which is where the National Training Center is here in Canada. And then we, I was nominated as, you know, an up and coming hopeful for the 2010 Olympics. And, you know, I got funding and all of the um, sort of the, the red carpet was laid out in front of me in order to make that dream come true. And going into a preseason summer training day, um, in a matter of three days, I lost feeling from my chest to my toes. I lost bladder control and developed double vision and literally went from one of the top speed skaters in Canada to not walking in three days. And that's when I was diagnosed with um, what would most likely be multiple sclerosis. Um, typically they needed at the time two relapses before they would make the official diagnosis. They also said I would probably never speed skate again. And to be honest, uh, because I was a teenager at the time, I was 18 years old, speed skating was all I knew. It was so my reality that I was going to go to the Olympics. So when they told me I would never speed skate again, I genuinely didn't believe it because it just wasn't part of my reality. So they sent me on my way um, with um, some information about MS because I had no idea what it was. And I was very determined to get back skating. So I utilized the resources I had on the national team, chiro, physio, nutritionist, sports psychs. And I got back to figuring out how to relearn how to walk, relearn how to bike. And eventually I skated again. Um, I sort of described myself at that point like a baby giraffe on ice because it was um, quite interesting trying to get back into that awkward pattern of speed skating when my legs were not even working three months prior. And I raced my first competition and all my teammates and the speed skating community was really happy for me. But I remember crying myself to sleep that night because my times were so sucky compared to before I was sick. And I wake up the next morning and the entire left side of my body went completely numb. Like it looked like I had Bell's palsy on the left side of my face. I couldn't even taste food on the left side of my mouth. My left arm didn't work, my left leg didn't work. It hurt, it was a struggle to even just get changed in the morning. And after that relapse, it really hit me that, okay, I'm not an invincible teenager. Um, this is real. I have multiple sclerosis and there's got to be something else that I can do. And as an athlete, you always have this mentality of build a team of experts in order to achieve optimal performance in speed skating. So it was a very natural mindset for me to apply to my health. 
And so I started taking the daily drug injection that was recommended to me by my neurologist. But then I wanted to look at what other expertise is out there and, and therapies I could try. So again, I had utilized the resources on the national team. And then I also had looked into nutrition. I became a nutritionist. I started studying herbal medicine and basically became a guinea pig for all things natural or conventional healing. And long story short, over the next five years, although I had a lot of ups and downs, um, I qualified for the trials for the 2010 Olympics in 2009. And I went into the preseason of training or pre-Olympic season. And literally overnight, I lost vision in my left eye. And so I get more tests done. And my neurologist said, I'm sorry, Crystal, but it looks like your disease is progressing. You might be developing progressive MS and could be in a wheelchair in the next couple of years, basically start organizing your life accordingly. And then they recommended a much more aggressive drug treatment plan. The list of side effects were quite long and intimidating. And I thought to myself, you know what, I'm never going to know whether it's this conventional stuff that's working or the less conventional stuff that's working if I'm doing both together. And if I've got nothing to lose, I might as well go with the unconventional stuff with side effects like a six pack and good sleep um, than the conventional stuff where the side effects are potential liver damage and you know the list goes on. So I made the decision to go off all of my drugs completely, treat my disease 100% naturally, and eight months later I came just a few spots off the Canadian Olympic team and fast forward forward nine years and that brings us to today. And although you can't tell, I am not in a wheelchair. I haven't had a single relapse since. I uh, do experience very manageable symptoms that come and go, and I have a protocol in place to deal with those symptoms so that they never turn into a real relapse. And yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful to be super healthy uh, again and, and regain my control of my life. I mean, it's an absolutely fascinating story. And, you know, it's, it almost sounds... Um unreal if anybody else would hear that. I mean, two things strike me some of the most in one side in, in, in a negative way that, you know, the, the medical experts that you saw gave you these almost like self-fulfilling prophecies, how bad things are going to be and that there's no, no way that you can change it. You'll end up in the wheelchair. On the other hand, on a positive side, I think it's remarkable um, that you did not fall into a deep depression and a state of uh, helplessness, um, but continue to pursue this goal of, 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 of being a world-class speed skater, which is sort of amazing. Like you almost try to completely ignore the, the seriousness of, of the reality and followed your, you know, you could say gut feelings or your, um, your, your personal emotions. I mean, that to me, that strikes me the most of, of your story so far. Well, and thanks to people like you, we can actually put scientific evidence behind those gut, gut feelings now, can't we? Yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah and I, I would not be surprised, you know, that, I mean, clearly you did a lot of things that we don't know, you know, because there's no evidence that, that supports this in, in big clinical trials. But, but one thing that we can say is, I mean, the, the power of mind um, and the, the influence that the brain can take on the body, on the immune system, is 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 much greater than you know than we learned in medical school. I mean, that, I, I think your example is your, your history is a very good example for that. And so let me let me ask you a few things, and we'll we'll come back to your remarkable personal story. Let me ask you a few things about your foundation. Could you briefly describe the foundation, what it stands for, and what programs and activities it uh, supports? Yeah, absolutely. So I started the Branch Out Neurological Foundation nine years ago, um, and it was it was really due to having this personal experience that highlighted some of the gaps and opportunities in the healthcare system that weren't necessarily being addressed. So I started the Branch Out Foundation to literally branch out and create an entire new field of study that focused on innovative technologies and non-pharmaceutical approaches for neurological disorders, whether it's a brain aging disorder like Alzheimer's or degenerative disease like Parkinson's or MS, or if it's a, a neurological um, injury like concussion or spinal cord injury or a mental health um, syndrome like um, depression or anxiety. 
Um, and I wanted to I wanted to fill that that gap in science so that we can have both pharmaceutical research and conventional research, as well as some of the unconventional um, therapies with the same level of research behind them so that ultimately the doctors and practitioners and patients will be armed with the best science for any um, therapy that they wanna look into. Yeah, that's really, uh, that's, that's really great. I mean, are there other um, organizations who have a similar uh, viewpoint on, on treatment and, and research in this area? You know what, if there were, especially nine years ago when I made this decision, I definitely wouldn't have started my own charity because it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, but since developing the Branchette Foundation, I realized that there really was a huge need for this, um, this kind of support in this area and niche research research um, in universities so far across Canada and hopefully globally one day. Um, but as we've um, collaborated with other organizations, there are certainly alignments in um, the missions between different organizations. But I would say that the Branch Out Foundation goes about things uh, quite a bit differently. Like we um, focus solely on unconventional approaches, but we also have a lot of um, support and initiatives to look at the, the innovative technologies to see how technology can help increase the effic efficiency and effectiveness of some of these non-pharmaceutical approaches. Yeah, just one, one comment, having learned you know, something from you about this, this approach, this holistic approach, you also have a very high level scientific advisory board from the University of Calgary. So this is, this is really a unique hybrid between uh, innovative approaches from, you know, out, uh, out of the box approaches with, with cutting edge neuroscience. I, I thought that was one of the, the, the most fascinating aspects of this foundation. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it was, you know, when we threw out the, the question and the offer to invite some top neuroscientists to join our scientific review panel, I was overwhelmed with their enthusiasm and sort of yes with an exclamation mark. And I realized that scientists are curious people by nature. And when there's a new area of research that first of all, they're scared might not have scientific validity behind it. And if they can actually play a role in increasing and ensuring scientific validity behind this area of research that they're fascinated um, with, um, they jumped on the opportunity. So it was, it was really well received and I'm so forever grateful for it. Yeah, one particular event that your foundation organized, I had the, the, the pleasure to participate, even though it was over Thanksgiving last fall. So I, I think the interest in this event uh, superseded for me the importance to stay home over uh, Thanksgiving. So this, it was, the, it was an event that your foundation organized and spons sponsored. It was called the Unlike Mind Summit at the Emerald Lake Lodge. Um, last November. would like to hear from you what, what inspired you to organize this remarkable conference and what impact has the conference had so far? Yeah, so it, this was a bit of a, this is maybe my, my science experiment. Um, and through the last nine years of developing the Branch Out Foundation, but having um, no real scientific or academic background in um, neuroscience or really um, business or starting a charity at a very early stage in creating the Branch Out Foundation, I had to learn the very valuable skill of outsourcing your life and finding experts from all different industries to help you drive your mission forward. And I love that concept of taking these resources and expert experts from different industries together to accomplish a common goal. And the more I got into the academic health space, I realized that there's a lot of room for um, be able to inject this kind of mindset and these kind of opportunities um, to apply in neuroscience. So uh, often when I'm talking about neuro uh, problems either in the healthcare system or neuroscience research system um, the perspectives that i get from all different industries are so fascinating and so different and i thought what if i had them all together um, to talk with each other so that i'm not sort of the middle person going back and forth and we can have these rich discussions um, considering all different angles and communicate to create more of a um, 
I guess, in unique perspective on how to tackle some of the neurological issues that were faced. Yeah, do you plan to, to repeat this experiment? I mean, it certainly be, as a participant, it was um, uh, incredibly inspiring and um, really not paralleled by any other conference that I've participated in, you know, with the participants ranging from people from the media, science, um, um, food production, chefs, uh, you know, just to name a few. Um, it would seem to me that to continue this kind of um, interdisciplinary event would really be something that the field and many fields really, really need. Yeah, you know, the, the reaction we received was really encouraging for us to continue to have either an Unlike Minds Summit as an annual or biannual thing, but to even organize more meetings, whether they're small scale or big scale, um, with the same concept in mind, because I think everyone appreciated learning perspectives from experts that are well respected in their field that they would have never had the opportunity to speak with, especially in a more intimate setting um, that was really focused on a topic that was mutually um, of interest. So absolutely, I wanna repeat this. We also received a lot of really positive feedback from donors. And certain people and organizations from my network want to fund um, an, another Unlike Minds Summit in the near future. So, yeah. That's great. That's great. You, you've made a, a, a remarkable statement, and I'm quoting you, therapies that promoted healthy thinking, healthy eating, and healthy moving were the most effective form of treatment for yourself, allowing me to live a healthy and active life drug-free. Can, can you tell me more about the treatments that you received and how this process not only helped you overcome a very serious illness, but also created a totally new professional trajectory for you? Yeah, absolutely. So it, so when I was looking at all of the different therapies and trying different things, I realized they fit always into these three main categories of healthy thinking, healthy moving, and healthy eating. And the healthy thinking part was probably one of the most profound um, areas that I was the least educated on before my illness. Um, however, I was learning skills like visualization um, in speed skating for sports performance and being able to apply that to all other areas in my life, including my health, has made a huge difference on, I mean, I deal with the disease that, um, you know, my, my life has changed overnight before in certain relapses. So I in the earlier days, I had to deal with a lot of anxiety about going to sleep because I was afraid that I would wake up, um, you know, with a different body because it's happened to me before. Um, I also, like I said about my neurologist, predicted and thought there was a good chance I would be in a wheelchair in two years. I mean, that, that brought a lot of stress. And to this day, I still have moments in my head where I'm like, is this the last mountain I'm ever gonna be able to climb? And so I have taken a, a daily practice to, um, with breathing exercises. I talk to professionals, I read self-help books. It was, it, it's made such a huge difference on my perspective um, and my attitude and my ability to um, deal with any kind of stress or anxiety and actually even turn it into this really positive energy. So that's a really important category for me. And the next one is healthy eating. So like I said, I became a nutritionist. So I'm always playing around with different diets that work best for my palate, my wallet, my lifestyle, my taste buds. Um, and I've been able to find a lot of balance with a diet that really works well for me. And if I was ever to have some symptoms, I would be able to tighten that diet up um, so that there was a little less flexibility and I was a little bit more strict. And then the third category is healthy moving. I mean, I, w I grew up as an elite athlete, so moving my body, I, um, I need to be, I'm like my dog, I need to be run every day. And if I'm not moving, I have to be thinking about moving. And um, 
even when I was in relapse, I would, I would literally visualize myself skating or running or biking um, because I just needed to move my body and I knew I felt better if I did every day. And so whether it was a 20 minute walk or a three hour bike ride, I, made sure, I make sure every day I'm, I'm moving something. So you really have, based on personal experience and trial and error, identified probably the three most important components to to health in general, you know, the mind, the brain, uh, diet, and and physical exercise, um, and it's 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 remarkable what, listening to you how you have used that to overcome a very serious illness and 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 cope with it. Yeah, it's inspiring. You Google MS treating it naturally, and you realize I'm one anecdotal case of of thousands out there. So, I'm. It's exciting to know that I'm not. I'm, I'm potentially not just a coincidence and that there might be some serious science behind this that could prove and help other people find what the exact, the right solutions are for their own health in those three categories. Uh, so one, one question, I, 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 you know, it's okay if you don't have an answer for it. It's a scientific question related to the hygiene hypothesis. So there's, there's pretty good scientific evidence supporting this hypothesis that as an explanation for the remarkable rise in prevalence of autoimmune disorders in the past 60 years in the developed world, but this phenomenon is now also observable with some delay in developing countries. Um, and these autoimmune diseases include not only um, uh, multiple sclerosis, but also ulcerative colitis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and several others. What's intrigued me that one of the highest rates of multiple sclerosis um, has been reported in Alberta. Um, do you have any idea why that might be or have you been part of discussions? Yeah. Why scientists think that that, that's, that, that unique prevalence uh, peak occurs in this area? Yeah, well, first of all, I think my parents would laugh if the, at the hygiene hypothesis because I was always a, known as to be quite a dirty, messy kid um, who ate a lot of dirt. Um, but at the same time, we live in a really clean environment. So um, I, I can't wait to see what the research will show in that area because it does make sense. Um, when it comes to Alberta, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, but I know that there's a lot of theories out there around um, low vitamin D. Um, our, we, we eat a lot of meat and potatoes in Alberta. Um, so we don't get a lot of healthy fats typically in like a standard diet here. Um, we don't live by an ocean, so we don't eat a lot of fish. Um, I think that might be a, a factor. We also have a lot of farming. So who knows, like maybe the farming industry and the soil and the pesticides and herbicides that we use has an effect on the soil microbiome and the, and the um, nutrients in the food that eventually we, we consume. So I, my gut feeling tells me that this is a multifactorial cause and Alberta has a few strikes against us for um, where we live on this, uh, according to the equator and our ability to absorb proper vitamin D um, and diet. Yeah, so it will be interesting to, to find out as, as you know, research in this area, particularly you mentioned the soil microbiome and the effect it has on, on food and the chemicals are being used that, you know, what role this might play in this. But he also was intrigued by hearing you uh, say that as a, as a kid, you were eating dirt. So there's a few books out now. I think one is actually called Eat Dirt, yeah. um, you know, which is obviously a very oversimplified um, yeah. explanation. So um, in, in addition to the likely role of a compromised gut microbiome immune system interaction early in life for you, immune system is programmed to differentiate between self and non-self. There's some evidence that mind-gut interactions play an important role in the triggering of symptom flares. In, in your opinion, does the mind and stress play an important role in the, in the trajectory and the course of the disease? Yes, <laughs> uh, 100%. I can always link my relapses and even my symptoms and I might be in denial with the level of stress I feel but then when I'm forced to think about am I stressed um, I'll realize that 
you know, it's not that you can prevent stress, but you can be proactive about how you're dealing with your stress. So I might have, you know, gotten lazy with breathing exercises for a while there during a busy time in my work. And I can always link um, stress to um, my symptoms. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that seems to be whenever you talk to people with any kind of autoimmune disease, seems to be a similar phenomenon. And I, I think it just supports the important role that uh, the autonomic nervous system and the, um, uh, and the stress system, the interaction it has with the immune system. So it's, it's both, you know, from personal experiences, but also from a, a large body of, of, of evidence uh, supports this close interaction between events that go on within the mind, particularly stressful ones and disease activity. One, one last question. I mean, this is really inspiring and could go on for um, any length of time to talk to you about this. Um, um, just one practical question. What, what are the future activities that, that you're planning to continue and expand the success of your foundation? I mean, you've um, had remarkable su success so far, but obviously you being a an ambitious um, competitive athlete, you're probably not going to sit down now and, 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 and enjoy the success of what you've created so far. Yeah. What, what would you say are the, the most important goals that you have? Yeah, I, it's, it's a good question. And I totally have that entrepreneurial itch where um, you're always looking at the next step. And, you know, in the first five years of, of funding research in NeuroCam, um, we realized that there's a lot of really good um, ideas and there's, and some of these ideas are showing to be really, really effective and impactful for patients. But I also started to understand the bigger picture of um, what barriers are in place right now to get all of the ideas and research results outside of the research lab and into the hands of patients themselves. So the last two years, I've been working with various experts from different industries, unlike mines, um, to develop a framework that we call eye to eye, which stands for idea to impact. And in our world, impact means clinical impact, not academic impact. And we looked at what are all the steps it takes to get an idea all the way to making clinical impact? What are the barriers in place? And then if we consolidated, you know, the hundreds of barriers that we can name into main categories, and we flip those categories upside down and turn them into opportunities, then we're looking at our new strategy for branch out so that we can not only fund and increase the area of research for non-pharmaceutical and innovative tech, but we can actually take that research outside of the lab and put it into either a commercializable product or a therapy or a technique that doctors can use or patients themselves um, right out of the lab could use. And then it would be a matter of scaling that up for um, global impact for these, re these ideas that started in, in sort of stage one from idea to impact. Okay, so sounds very exciting. For, for people that want to learn more about your foundation and um, learn more about your life story, where, where can they find this on the web? Could you give the name of a website or? Yeah, so you can put our website to the test to see if it answers most of your questions at branchoutfoundation.com. Okay. Well, thank you so much for this inspiring conversation. That's, you know, it's, we've talked a lot before, but this every time I, I hear your, your life story and your, your goal-oriented efforts towards improving the, this um, you know, very serious and compromising disease, it's, it's, really, it's really exciting. So thanks a lot for taking the time. Hopefully we'll interact more in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to call you a teammate in this journey. Mm -hmm.